All right. Okay. So now, now, now we can start. Um, so the, the file I gave you in project number three is just a simplified version of a, an LAS file. Instead of giving you everything, well actually, I, I don't have the LSA file for that example. But otherwise, I, I would have given you anything. And it will look the same as the one you already work with, right? Where you have depth, and then you have uh, several measurements, like porosity, uh, bulk density, uh, sonic transit time, uh, resistivity, spontaneous potential, or, or some others. In that data set um, that you have, you have both shear and P wave velocity, opposite to this one. In this one, you just have uh, P wave velocity. Uh, whenever you know it's not specified what kind of transit time it is, usually it's P wave, like in this case. So if, if you were to work with, with uh, this data over here, you wouldn't be able to calculate Poisson ratio because you need two velocities to do that. You will just be able to calculate the constraint modules M. But that's it. You, you cannot do anything, anything else. But in the data set that I gave you over here, you have both the shear and the compressive or um, P wave. And with that, uh, you can calculate the Young modulus and the Poisson ratio. And, and actually, I have those equations here. So let me change to the dog camera. <clears throat> this is the last thing that we discussed uh, on, on Tuesday. And and we said that those two depend on the Young modulus and the Poisson ratio. And the equations for that are, let me find them. The dynamic Young modulus is going to be equal to the density times shear wave square times 3 times BP square minus 4 BS square divided BP square minus shear wave square. All of that. And the dynamic Poisson ratio is going to be this number divided <coughs> by this difference. So with those two, you're going to be able to determine the the, the Yam modulus and the, and the Poisson ratio. And, and you know, uh, from here, to get from here to there, it, it, it's just math. Uh, it's not too complicated. Uh, the, the only thing that, that, that you have to apply is that you know already what is M. We already calculated this. We derived the equation for M, for the Yam modulus as a function of uh, M as a function of Young modulus and Poisson ratio. And we also, we have also derived this one, right? Which I think in my notes I'm looking at right now, it's wrong. It should be plus. So I have, I have minus here, but we show that it's plus, right? Let me double check. Yes, it's wrong. One plus Poisson ratio. So if you use these equations and combine it with that, you you get those equations, okay? And uh, and that's what you have to do in order to compute uh, that uh, those elastic coefficients. So let let me see if uh, we're, we're forgetting something over here. Um, 
Okay, so th this was the, the project that we have to work on. Uh, we haven't quite got here yet, all right? So we have density, we have P wave, we have S wave. With that, uh, we can calculate dynamic Poisson ratio and dynamic Young modules. Uh, that's relatively easy. You just apply the equations that we just wrote and, and that's it. Remember that the velocity is going to be the reciprocal of the slowness and always I recommend that you work in an international system. If you want to report your values in some other uh, units, just work everything out in the international system and then convert them to that unit that, that you may want to change your, your, your result to, to be displayed. Uh, now the question is, what do we get from the dynamic to the static? Okay, and we we started talking a little bit about that, but we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, today. Um, and I think I have a little bit of this. No, I I don't. So I'm going to start over here. Um, all right, so. Um, The dynamic Young modules and the and the what is called dynamic Poisson ratio, but in general, the the properties of a rock subjected to small strain and to very high strain rate, they are not going to be the same as the equivalent properties uh, of the rock at large strain, and that should be a Poisson ratio and small strain rate. We're going to see the, the reason for that la later on, uh, more in detail when we go, for example, into viscoelasticity and into portal mechanics. But for now, I'm just going to ask you to, I'm going to give some reasons now, but later on, we're going to see some other reasons uh, to explain this, this difference. Um, usually, the, the real or not a real, but uh, we, we can simplify this. Uh, instead of dealing with two numbers, uh, we just can deal with one number, which is the real number that is controlled by the structure of the solid, which is the shear modulus. The shear modulus uh, is, uh, depends on the strength uh, or the stiffness of the, of the rock or sediments, and that one is going to be different than the static uh, shear modulus. What is the shear modulus of a fluid? It's zero, right? So if we want to characterize a solid, uh, the real property to characterize is the shear modulus. So uh, <clears throat> it turns out that this shear modulus, it's a function of the strain magnitude. So if you remember, shear stress is equal to shear modulus times shear strain. So if you have a very small, tiny deformation, uh, your shear modulus very likely is, is going to be high. But if you have a, a very large strain, that involves some other processes, uh, that sh uh, shear modulus is, is going to decrease. So usually, this has a shape which is more or less like this. Where I want to write this again to just make it clear. This is the shear strain magnitude. You, you, you could say, but why? Why? What's going on here? Yes. Um, well, it, it depends. I mean, I, I just want to make it general, okay? I'm not going to go in detail. Uh, th there are several um, models that will allow you to tell what is the variation of G uh, with uh, the, the shear strain magnitude, and some of those uh, uh, are invoke a, a log relationship uh, with this one. But I just want to make the point that, that this one is 
the, the higher the strain, uh, the lower this G is going to be. Uh, so what's going on here? Well, very likely when you have very small strain, you just have elastic deformation of the rock with no damage, uh, no nothing. Uh, when you go into larger strains, probably you can have grains that, uh, for example, let's make this over here. Let's say that you have three grains. So if you apply a force over here, you're just going to have the stiffness of the contacts, all elastic deformation. But probably if you were to apply a very large uh, strain, probably this one will move over here and it's not going to be elastic anymore. So you're going to be what, what, what is called uh, lumping some other deformations into, into that strain. And if you were to assume that that's linear elastic, that will give you an equivalent lower uh, shear modulus because you have some other plastic deformation uh, going on in here. Uh, but in general, this is the case. The, the bigger the shear strain, and in general, the bigger the strain, the lower this uh, uh, shear module is going to be. So uh, what is the case of uh, elastic waves? Small strains, how small? Anyone? Anyone can tell me? Well, they, they can be as, as small as almost as you want, as you can measure, right? But, uh, but typically, in, uh, if you do uh, wellbore uh, logging or if you do crosswell uh, sonic, which is means that you put some uh, uh, a source on one well and a receiver in another well and you send waves, uh, you usually are, are very tiny, but enough to measure. And, you know, it, it could be very small, like 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 5, e even less. So they're very, very tiny strains. When, when you go uh, into geological scale... It's supposed to be 10 to the minus 6. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you very much. It wouldn't make sense to have here a, a negative... Uh, strain. So 10 to the minus 6. So uh, when, when you go into the laboratory scale and, and we fail rocks and we measure the young modules, uh, we get into deformations in the order of 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2. And when you go even to geological scale, you can have even larger deformations. And sometimes, you know, formation is so large that it wouldn't make sense to even assume a linear elasticity. So, so there we are at the limit of, of our assumptions. But, uh, but notice, you know, how many orders of magnitude you have in difference. And with such a big difference, you should expect changes on the compliance or the stiffness of, of that rock. Um, and because of this, uh, the uh, uh, dynamic modulus is going to be very typically uh, larger than, than the static modulus. There is one more thing over here uh, that we also have to consider. This is the main one, but there is also an influence on the shear strain rate. And um, in order to simplify a plot that I'm going to do later, uh, I'm just going to plot the inverse of the shear strain rate, OK? Uh, so that, that would mean that as I go to, um, I run over here, uh, this is going to be a very small strain rate, right? And if I'm over here, that's going to be a, a very large uh, strain rate. Uh, let, no, okay. You see, it gets confusing, but uh, this is going to be the strain rate. Uh, so, uh, 
when I get close to zero, there's going to be a, lar a very large strain rate. It's going to take me over here. And a very uh, small strain rate is going to take me somewhere over here. And it happens something similar. When you have a very high strain rate, uh, especially with rocks that are, are filled with fluids, sometimes you, your stress may be applied so quickly that you don't let the fluids move inside. So you have an additional, like an additional spring inside the rock, an additional stiffness that, uh, that does not let uh, the, the, the fluid move and, uh, and therefore you have an, a, a higher stiffness. You may be adding the stiffness of the fluid itself. In very large time scales, and whenever uh, you have a, a very low strain rate, you can drain the fluids. And that's something which is called uh, drain loading. So even if your rock is full of fluids, if you apply very slowly your load, you let it drain, and that's not going to contribute uh, to the equivalent stiffness of the rock. So here, you're going to get also something similar like the other one. But notice now it is the inverse of the shear strain rate. And also for uh, a phenomenon called visco elasticity, uh, the rocks are going to, uh, when you give them enough time, the rocks usually start to creep and start to deform very slowly so that, that the equivalent modulus is also, is also very, uh, very small when you let them creep. It's like this. Let's, let's try an example with this door. So o over there, you see you have a damper, right? So I I if you let it close, it will close very quickly. And if I push it slowly, it won't be very hard to do that. But if you try to do this, well, it's not working that well. <laughs> but, uh, but, but you see what I mean, right? You know, when we have sometimes these dampers. If you do it very quickly, it will be much stiffer than if you do it slowly. Because you're, you're not letting the fluids on top of there uh, move, dissipate. So it's, it's, it's the same in here. Um, so actually, this, this is a very, very complex problem. And uh, what, what we need, what we measure in the field most times, are these elastic waves uh, with wellbore logging or with cross well logging or with seismic, you get these uh, elastic waves. And again, this is going to be a high strain rate. Elastic waves are also going to be in this side. But sometimes what we really need is this. It's the applications for the reservoir or application at a geological scale in order to predict the in situ stresses. So how we get from this dynamic G to this static G, it's, it's a very tough problem, OK? Uh, a simplification which is done uh, usually in, the, in industry practice is to say that uh, the dynamic Poisson ratio, uh, well, the static, that's, that's our unknown. The static Poisson ratio is going to be equal to the dynamic Poisson ratio and uh, the static Young modulus is going to be a linear function of the dynamic Young modulus. And how you get this value over here? You go to the lab, you measure your static Young modulus in the lab at a large strain and a strain rate which is similar to the one in the field. And you correlate that with dynamic measurements of those same rocks. And usually, if this is a line one to one, uh, you're going to get points that line up something like this to which you can throw a correlation and say, what is this slope FSD? And uh, 
And by doing that, you can relate now, now these two. But th th this doesn't mean this is, this is accurate, okay? It's better than nothing, but it doesn't mean it, it's accurate. Uh, actually, many of these experiments in the lab are done in very small rocks. And it's very important also to consider the size of your formation because the shear modulus is also going to change according to the size of the rock sample that you take. If you take a very small rock sample, probably it's going to be very high. If you take a very large rock mass uh, with fractures, with uh, many other things inside, it's going to be uh, very likely much smaller. It's the same as permeability. It depends on the scale at which you look at. The mechanical properties are the same. Okay? Uh, but uh, this is generally a, a a relationship which is used a lot, and as I told you before, it is uh, better than nothing. And that's a, what you have to do here. Uh, so once you compute the density, and uh, you compute uh, the, the P waves, and then from here, probably you're going to get uh, the E dynamic. And after you get the E dynamic, you're going to get another one over here, which is going to be the E static and the Poisson ratio static. And now we're very close to the solution, OK? Uh, so let's see what else we have to do in order to get there. OK, so if you remember, we solve this problem of one dimensional strain assuming that there are no lateral strains that epsilon 3 3 is different than 0 uh, but epsilon 1 1 and epsilon 2 2 are equal to zero, right? Uh, and working through the equations, uh, we found that sigma 3, 3 was proportional uh, with epsilon 3, 3 through the constraint modulus. And uh, sigma 1, 1 and sigma 2, 2 were proportional to sigma 3, 3 through the uh, Poisson ratio. Let's talk about that Poisson ratio before we go into the general equation. What are the, the ranges of the Poisson ratio for rocks? So this Poisson ratio, and I want to plot the lateral stress coefficient according to linear elasticity. Uh, what, what are the limits of Poisson ratio? I know, I know you know these guys. Come on, don't be shy. Uh, how much? Okay, let's put zero then here and point 0.5 here, okay? Uh, bigger than point 0.5, uh, it doesn't make sense. Uh, smaller than zero, doesn't really happen in, uh, in rocks. Uh, all right, so what about if Poisson ratio is equal to zero? What is going to be the value of the lateral stress coefficient? It's going to be zero, right? And what about if uh, the Poisson ratio is 0.5? What's going to be the lateral stress coefficient value? 1. So this is going to be 1 over here, right? And, uh, and this is going to be 1. And what is the typical Poisson ratio of a rock? Let's just choose a value right in the middle of this, OK? Say 0.25. That, that could be, right? That, that's a reasonable Poisson ratio. And what is going to be the value of the lateral stress coefficient? One third, right? So one third. Then we have a data point over here. And I'm not going to calculate that for all the range, but you can imagine that this is going to be a curve. Or it's going to be a, a concave curve. 
And uh, that's going to be the value of this, the lateral stress coefficient as a function of the Poisson ratio, right? And, and, and this is a very interesting plot, okay? Why? Because it tells you that the lateral stress depends on the Poisson ratio. So if you had a rock with a, a very small Poisson ratio, if, if it were to be confined on the sides and you apply stress on the top, it, it will just deform, but it wouldn't expand to, to the sides because Poisson ratio is zero. And also if, also if it is unconfined, you can push from the top and it, it is not going to expand to the sides because the Poisson ratio is zero. So in theory, if you had a rock with Poisson ratio equal to zero, the effective stress at depth will be equal to zero, the lateral stress. There will be just vertical stress, no lateral stress. If you had a rock or, or some sort of geomaterial uh, with a Poisson ratio very uh, close to 0.5, if you push it confined, what's going to happen to that? Well, well but let's assume I, I'm with confined. I'm, I'm, I mean, let's let's be more precise. I mean, lateral strain equal to zero. So this is going to be lot of lateral stress. How much? You can tell me how much. It's going to be the same as the vertical, right? Exactly the same. So I, I learned this from a, from a friend of mine. Uh, that uh, that learned this was some other class uh, in geotechnical engineering that says if you get to this scenario, it means that the rock is pushing to the sides with all its weight, right? Because all the weight which is on top now is being applied on the sides. The horizontal, vertic the horizontal effective stress is the same as the effective uh, vertical stress. And if you were to do, take this same rock uh, unconfined, it will expand a lot to the size in order to preserve its volume. Volumetric strain will be equal to zero. And last, if we had a, a rock with a more reasonable Poisson ratio, uh, something which is more common, it will, it will shorten a little bit, not as much as, as this one over here, and the lateral stress is going to be a third of the vertical stress. And if you were to do the same test unconfined with this rock, uh, it would shorten in one direction, it would span a little bit uh, into the transversal direction. It's all a function of the Poisson ratio. So um, typical rocks have a, a Poisson ratio from about 0.1 to 0.3. But there are also some other rocks that have a very high Poisson ratio that sometimes it can tend to 0.5. Can anyone give an example of these type of rocks? We're going to see later on something which is called undrained loading. If you have undrained loading, which means that you don't let the fluid escape of a clay-rich rock or a clay-rich sediment, the, po the Poisson ratio is going to approach the 0.5. There is going to be very little volumetric strain. If you have salt rock, you can also model it as a uh, 
elastic media with a Poisson ratio close to 0.5 because it's very viscous and it, it deforms a, a lot on the direction perpendicular to the direction in which you apply stress uh, because it's, it's, very, it's very viscoelastic. So there are some types of rock that, that you can model with a Poisson ratio uh, close to 0.5. And at here at 0.5, probably you're going to have fluids, right? Fluids like brine, uh, oil, and some other fluids. You could, those would approach the limit of a Poisson ratio equal to 0.5. So, so this Poisson ratio is very important, okay? And it, depending on that Poisson ratio, uh, you can predict what is the variation of stress as a function of depth, uh, which is due to the weight of rock on top. But we're missing something, okay? And we're gonna work on that something right now. I like that, that you come back to these equations and now you imagine that these two are not zero. So, so if you remember, this was the vertical strain, and those two were the horizontal. So if those two are not zero, you can make the same thing we did before, combine equations, and you will find uh, that there's, there's no need to do that here in class, but, but it's very easy, just some algebra. Uh, if you want to do that uh, later on, uh, you're welcome to to work out through the equations. But what you're going to get as a result is that sigma 1, 1, now for epsilon 1, 1, uh, which is different than 0, and epsilon 2, 2, which is different than 0, sigma 1, 1 is going to be equal to So this plus that plus the component of the overburden, which is still the same. And sigma 2, 2 is going to be this plus this other term. again, the component of the overburden. A few things to notice over here. The overburden is always there. So, if you push the rock in this direction, it was going to, it's going to try always to expand in the perpendicular direction. But now we have two additional terms, because now we are adding, uh, on top of this strain that we're putting in this direction, we're adding strains in this direction and in that direction. And those are usually caused by 